Hi, thanks for joining me for another video from Counselor Tips. The reason I made this video is to make it easy so we actually do use decision-making models because they're not just relevant, they really are required. I'll cover several decision-making models, but one thing I want to stress about decision-making models is it doesn't matter how many stages that they have. They may have steps one through three, one through five, one through nine. I've seen really complex models that have up to 15 or more steps to take. So let's simplify it so you stop feeling overwhelmed by decision-making models and more open to using them. Decision-making models are essentially three stages. One is identify the problem. Two is identify potential solutions. And three is implement those solutions that you've discovered. So let's cover the first one that we have access to right through the American Counseling Association. It's a seven stage model. It was designed by Foster, Miller and Davis. Steps one through three are identifying the problem. They break it down to identify the problem, apply the ACA code of ethics, and determine the nature and dimensions of the actual dilemma. Steps four through six are finding the solution. It's generate potential course of action, consider potential consequences of each course of action for all the parties involved, not just yourself, but also clients, supervisors, stakeholders, whoever it might be. And six is evaluate the selected course of action. Step seven of this seven stage decision-making model is to apply the solution. Another decision-making model is by Corey, Corey and Gallan. This is a counseling decision-making model. There are eight stages in this model. Stages one and two are identifying the problem. Those are identify the problem or dilemma. So you determine the nature of the problem and gather the necessary information. Consult with the client frequently through this process. Number two is identify potential issues involved. So you would list and describe the issues. List and assess the rights, responsibilities, and the welfare of everyone who's involved in the situation. We also want to consider the broader context, such as their social or cultural context as well. Steps three through seven are identify the solutions in this model. Step three is to review the relevant ethics codes. And in this section, we want to reflect on our own values and see if they're in conflict in any way with the code of ethics. Step four in this model is to know the applicable laws. So we're going to investigate any HIPAA, federal, or state, or local laws that may be in play with the situation that we're assessing. Step five is to obtain consultation. We want to consult with colleagues that can help us look past our own biases. Someone who can have a more objective view as to what we are dealing with. Step six is to consider the possible course of action. We want to look at any course of action through these lenses, ethically, legally, and clinically, and see if there's any ramification related to any of the solutions that we've identified. We want to do this for each solution. Step seven, is to enumerate the consequences of the various decisions. We want to consider the consequences of each action as they may play themselves out with not only the client, but all the other parties that can be touched by the situation. And the last stage of this model is to apply the solution. This step eight is to decide on the best course of action. We review all the information that we've gathered in the previous steps, and then we decide on a course of action and implement it. We want to make sure we document our process, our decision, the implementation, and outcome of the decision we've made. Even though we're not social workers, it is a similar profession, and so I'll cover the ethical decision-making model for social workers. This ethical decision-making model has 15 stages. It's a lot. 
but they're broken down in a way that is maybe a little more comprehensive than the previous two models that I've covered. Stages one through seven have you identifying the problem. The first stage is to identify the ethical concern. You want to clearly articulate the professional values that may be in conflict. Are your personal values influencing the decision-making process? Is there a conflict between your personal and professional views? Step two, what is my immediate response and the best way to resolve the ethical dilemma? Here in step three, it is indicated for people to check out the social work ethical guidelines. But in this case, you're a counselor, so I'm going to guide you to go back to the ACA Code of Ethics when using this model to help yourself. We want to ask ourselves in Stage 3, does the Code of Ethics provide guidance and clarity? We want to identify the specific ethics codes that help provide clarity and are applicable to the case we are evaluating. In Stage 4, we want to consult with agency policies and the best standard of practice. In this stage, you may have to consult with superiors or even other providers. In stage five, we want to make sure we check out any legal considerations. Again, we're back to investigating HIPAA, federal law, state, and local laws. Don't forget to also consult your licensing law. In stage six, we're going to look at any cultural considerations. Again, we're not just looking at the client, but we're also including stakeholders, such as family members and friends. In stage seven, we want to make sure that this issue was or was not addressed in the informed consent process. And in this model, stages eight through 13 are about finding a solution. Here's how this model breaks that down. In stage eight, we want to know what are the available options or choices to resolve our concern or the dilemma. We want to analyze the risk and benefit of each option we discover. Also in step eight, we want to take a look at what steps are necessary to reduce risk and to not compromise our ethical standard. Step nine suggests that we consult with a peer, which would be a fellow counselor, a supervisor, or a superior at your place of employment. Step 10 asks you to ask yourself this question. Does the context of practice make a difference? Such as, is there a difference between a person being treated in individual counseling or family counseling? In step 11, it's suggested that you discuss this with the client in places where it's appropriate. We always want to include clients in making decisions when it in no way jeopardizes their progress, recovery, or advancement. In step 12, we want to consider the impact this will have on our therapeutic process with clients. Lastly, in step 13, it asks us to check out any other additional resources that could be available to help us in our decision making. In the last stage of this model, which is applying the solutions, are steps 14 and 15. In step 14, we want to make sure we document the ethical decision making process that we've done. And in step 15, we want to monitor and evaluate the implementation of our decision and modify it as necessary. Although we've only covered a handful of decision-making models, I certainly hope you found them to be helpful. Choose which one suits you best, but remember, 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 document what you've done so that if you're ever questioned in the future by a state licensing board or other professionals, you can show your process and how you came to the best decision how you implemented it, how you followed up and reviewed it, and either adjusted the decision you made or stuck with the decision you made. If you found this video to be helpful, please consider giving me a thumbs up. It helps more people see videos that they need to teach them. If you know a student, a counselor, or a supervisor 
You could learn the ease of taking any decision-making model and turning it into three simple stages, then please consider sharing this video. Come back and see me soon.